Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Saturday Select episode. I am Chuck, your curator for this weekend. You know how perfume works? Well, if you have less than an hour, we can explain it to you. This one goes back to February 19th, 2015. How perfume works right here, right now. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark with Charles W. Chuck Bryant and Jerry Jairs. <laughs> That'd be great if that was her name. Jerry Jerry Jairs. Yeah. Like Tony, Tony, Tony. To- my friend used to call them Tony, Tone I, Tone Y. Because of the spelling. Oh, no, I know. Oh, okay. But I thought the last one was an E with a little accent. Well, that was Tony, but he didn't say Tony accent. I would tone say I, that's Tone, tone, tone. tone. Well, but the point is it's E-I-Y are the three letters. When Jerry pressed record, did you think we were going to be talking about Tony, Tony, Tony? <laughs> I never know what the heck we're going to talk about for the first 30 seconds. I would not have predicted that one. <laughs> uh, I was going to tell a little story, but I'm not going to now. What's that uh, scent you're wearing? It is El de, de Chuck Musk. It's called Chusk. In French, that means water of Chuck Musk. <laughs> gross <laughs> yeah i'm wearing dracar noir uh, gross. are you really no no <laughs> don't you think you'd be able to smell it well yeah sure i never know i don't want to like i'm very sensitive to making fun of people and what they choose to do you know i'm not making fun of anybody no but i didn't want to say you're wearing cologne you're wearing dracar noir gross uh i used to love dracar noir back when i was in like seventh eighth grade i believe it man alive those are the cologne days i looked it up and i was like what does dracar noir mean no- noir black right sure um what is dracar apparently dracar or dakar is a name for a viking ship nice so Dracar has kind of come into um, French colloquially as uh, like a big ship or a yacht. Mm-hmm. So I think Dracar Noir, here's the fact of the podcast, sadly, uh, means black yacht. Nice. Yep. That means you are very fine because all you see is white yachts. You ever seen a black yacht? Nope. That would be pretty slick. Yeah, it'd be very hot. That's why they don't paint yachts black, I would imagine. Well, yeah, I guess so. Because they sit out in the sun all day. Um. So I wore Benetton Colors. I never wore that one. And um, that smell today is still very evocative uh, because I have the bottle. I don't know if I still had it. I had it. Keister? Yeah. (laughs) What? (laughs) Yeah, I keistered it in 1989. Every once in a while when you're feeling nostalgic, you just shed it. No, I can't find it. I just... Uh, oh, where is it? I thought you were saying you still had the bottle. I keistered it and I can't find oh, it. Oh, I see. <laughs> Somewhere, Somewhere up in, in your abdomen. <laughs> um, no, I had it for a lo- the longest time. I don't think I still have it, though. Um, and as we'll see, cologne can go bad, but this was in a dark drawer and it seemed to smell the same to me. Yeah, that sounded like uh, perfume industry propaganda. Oh, to keep you like that. It no matter what you sure. do to protect it, it's still going to go bad in two That's years. That's like uh, these Vicodin are no good anymore. Exactly. Don't believe that for a second. No, but definitely don't just assume that they've downgraded in potency and take like four. Right. You Although know? I do think, <laughs> I do think cologne and perfume could definitely go bad if not cared for correctly. Um, right, but if you care for it correctly, yeah, yeah, yeah. We should probably just go ahead and say if you keep it out of the sunlight, yeah. Keep the artificial light to a minimum. Sure. Keep it in its original bottle. Mm -hmm. Uh, Capped. Yeah. Um, Supposedly, it stays good for two years. Yeah, yeah. That's the part that I think is BS. As long as you don't expose it to the outside air, Mm -hmm. right, Uh, keeping it in its original bottle, Mm -hmm. and the sunlight's not saying they're breaking its uh, molecular chains, it's going to be fine and stable. Yeah, I mean, I had literally had proof uh, on cologne and Vicodin (laughs) that I'm happy to, to come out on the record about. That's great, man. All right. This is a good article, I thought. Well, oh, I, n- a nice choice. Yeah, I, I agree. I think perfume is surprisingly interesting. It's one of those things where you just take for granted or you think like, oh, that's just for the fashionista glitterati types or, you know, Madison Avenue folks kind of thing. <laughs> and then you dig into it and you're like, no, this is pretty cool. 
perfumes for everyone. Even if you don't wear it, it's still interesting to know about. Like, for example, the history. Did you read much of the history? Yeah, it's all, um, you sent me some pretty cool stuff that, um, and this isn't necessarily perfume, but I guess perfume is really anything that smells. Yes. You know, it doesn't have to smell great. Yeah, we're, we're generally talking about perfume meaning like a product that you go buy yeah. to in, to change or enhance your scent, right? Yeah. That, But if you look around, like everything is perfumed unless it's specifically marketed as unscented or non-perfumed. Yeah. But just about everything else has some sort of perfuming to it. Yeah, but it's got it has to be a, a, a substance. That's what the, is the distinction between like a perfume and an odor. Yeah, yeah, like I guess the odor actually comes off of, say, the plant. Right. The perfume is when you go to that plant and squeeze the odor out of it, yeah. put it in a bottle, put it on your skin. Yeah. Well, you don't even need to put it in a bottle. Yeah, I guess not. You just rub those leaves all over you. Um, but, like I said, back in the day, ancient priests, you sent me this thing that said they burned incense uh, initially to cover up stinky dead animal carcasses that yeah. they were sacrificing, which makes sense that the Latin... Uh, Translation is through the smoke. So perfume means. Yeah, like you can smell it through the smoke of, I guess, these burning dead animals. Or through the smoke, you uh, feel a lot better about sacrificing animals because you can't smell the death. Yeah. Uh, The ancient Egyptians very quickly. So like originally these were priests using perfume to cover up animal sacrifices. Right. The ancient Egyptians said, we got a better idea. Let's use the glands from those animals to scent ourselves yeah. for loving. Well, yeah, let's put it on our stinky parts. Yeah, originally it was animal sacrifice and it went very quickly into sexuality. And ever since then, the purpose of perfume has remained virtually unchanged. It is to um, stimulate sexuality in some form or fashion. Yeah. Um, Especially men wearing cologne. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get to some of those reasons in a bit, but... um. That's a good primer. I never really thought about that, but I guess you're right. You're wearing it um, to smell more attractive, even in, in a, on the friendship tip. Sure. Doesn't necessarily have to be sexual, I don't think. Well, it depends, because some of the early um, ingredients that stuck around until, in some cases, the 1990s, and are still being used in other cases, are from basically the sex glands, the scent glands of animals. Yeah, and uh, this article points out it's like it's funny to think about the first person who saw a, a skunk and said, "You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna get all up in that anal gland and and rub some of that on me." Exactly. Or the musk deer. That's, the the musk deer. Let me get some of that. The beaver um, produces castorium. The civet cat, which is a Himalayan cat. Well, that's the, the anal skunk glands. Too. That's the skunk one? Yeah, there's like a dozen animals they classify as civet cats. And then ambergris. Yeah. Or ambergris. I don't. I can't remember which way to pronounce it. Let's just say it's both are acceptable. We'll okay. Ag- we'll agree to disagree. Ambergris. I can't remember. Anyway, it's, that's... It's the whale stuff. Yes. Yeah, so, so supposedly everybody said, well, it's whale vomit. When a whale eats a squid... And its beak gets kind of in its stomach, and it needs to dislodge it. Beak? It pu- yeah, squid beak. Oh, okay. I thought I, I think they were called the, beaks. Yeah, oh, it's a beak. It's probably the most disturbing part on any animal on the planet. The fact that a squid has a hard beak just like a bird. Yeah. Is Why is like, that disturbing? It, be, it just keeps me up at night. Because a squid <laughs> is like gelatinous and yeah. flimsy. It's not supposed to have a hard beak that can break bone. Well, I think it is supposed to. That's wrong to me. <laughs> uh, so if, if a whale has that beak in its stomach after yeah. eating a squid, it needs to get rid of it. So the common wisdom was that it puked up this stuff, and that's what ambergris is. Yeah, this is the sperm whale specifically. Right. Yeah. But, but And this ambergris is like this, well, it's just like bile and puke and that kind of thing, but it floats on the... On the um, surface of the ocean yeah. and photodegrades and hardens and turns into this waxy substance that's actually flammable that can have its own scent that has long been and in still in some cases used as a major ingredient in perfume, right? Yeah, I think it's supposed to uh, make perfume stick to your body more. Right, it's a fixative is yeah. what it's called. Um, the weird thing is, is there recently 
finding out that it's possible that ambergris, it, it comes out of the bottom end of the whale. Yeah, they don't puke it up. Not the mouth. Sure. They poop it out. That yeah. It's basically whale diarrhea that you're using in your perfume. <laughs> so consider this. Depending on the perfume and the fixatives it uses, mm-hmm. you could be using anal glands from a beaver and diarrhea from a whale <laughs> in order to make yourself smell sexy. Yeah. And what's insane, Chuck, is that it actually works. Uh, well, sure. That's debatable, depending on who you are, I guess. Right. I hate the smell of perfume. Uh, all perfumes. There's not a single perfume scent, even a component of a perfume that you find pleasant. I, I don't like perf- uh, scented perfume for women, specifically, is what I'm talking about, as far as working sexually. Um, and I... Because and it, no, it doesn't. I don't even mean like sexually necessarily that it, like you're worked up, getting a little hot under the collar. Even just yeah, relaxing, not, not pleasing to me at all. Really? Nope. Don't like it. Are you? Do you? Do you like scents of anything? I mean, like Emily mm. makes all sorts of soaps and stuff. Do you like any of those scents? Those are all natural. That's the difference. Most every perfumed product is synthetic. It's uh, on the market. It depends, for sure. The cheaper ones definitely are, but not all of them are. Eh, most of them. I mean, there's still plenty of that use, like, ambergris. What's more natural than whale diarrhea? <laughs> well, that's true. You know? Uh, not here in the U.S., though. We should point out it's illegal to use that in perfumes in the U.S. of A. But the European... endangered. Yes, but yeah. the European perfume houses still do. But no, I'm very specifically averse to most scents because we don't use... Uh, chemical products as much as possible so like i don't use scented sprays scented deodorants like febreze to me is like the most disgusting thing you can do to your home oh yeah fabric uh softener uh sheets uh uh, laundry detergent Uh like nothing nothing with with scents i hate it right there's nothing to me worse than like going to a hotel and smelling scented sheets that have clearly been washed with some kind of perfumey detergent. What if it smells Hate like it. S- something pleasant, though? I mean, like, there's nothing. I, like, I understand what... No, they're all supposed to be pleasant. Like, this smells like lavender. And none of it does. To you, it's just like, this is synthetic, so it feels bad to me. And smells bad, yeah. I gotcha. Um, but the the idea, you just rattle off a bunch of, like, um, uses for perfume beyond actual perfume. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's actually kind of an old concept. Um the what's long been considered the seat of Europe's perfume industry yeah. is a uh, Grasse, I think G R A S S E, okay. in the south of France, uh-huh. and it's got this unusual microclimate to where all of these wonderful plants, um, like jasmine and orange blossoms and lavender and all yeah. this stuff, can grow, and the locals f- figured out. Number one, that they needed to grow the stuff, but also to extract it in different ways. You can extract the essential oils. You can extract absolutes. You can extract concretes. Yeah. But what you're doing is extracting these odorant molecules from plants Mm -hmm. and using it to perfume. But what they were originally using it to perfume, and I think like the 14th or 13th century, were leather gloves. So remember Catherine de Medici? Oh, yeah. She's been coming up a lot lately. A lot. Yeah. Um. She was given some scented gloves by the tanners of uh, Grasse, France, uh-huh. which was originally their, that was their gig, was making leather goods, but they stunk like death. So just like those ancient priests, the people of Grasse said, we need to perfume these. They came up and started this whole trend yeah. of perfumed leather gloves yeah. by sending a complimentary pair to Catherine de' Medici, who loved them. And then all of a sudden, bam, Grasse is not only making these awesome leather goods, it becomes the perfume capital of the world and stays that way for a very long time. Because she essentially was the first uh, celebrity sponsor of a product. Right. And <laughs> she was in the copies of the local rag saying, I love the smell of my... Lavender leathers. Exactly. <laughs> uh, that's a pretty cool story. Yeah. And so that was the heart of it all then. Yeah, and Grasse still makes not nearly as much as they used to, but they still produce tons of essential oils every year of all these wonderful plants. Nice. Yeah. See, I'm down with the essential oils. That's different. Right, but that stuff is frequently used in perfumes. I mean, they might not be using yeah. it in like your you know, Tide or anything like that, 
that's probably a synthetic <laughs> scent. Not probably. It's absolutely a synthetic scent. But there are still plenty of perfumes that do use essential oils in yeah. there as as uh, smell molecules. Sure. Well, the reason people they don't is because it's expensive. Right. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about what perfume as the the stinky stuff that you use an atomizer if you're fancy to spray on your body to smell sexy. Okay. Um, and a little bit about smell in general, I guess. Uh, the liquid perfume that we're talking about is basically just a concoction of uh, alcohol and water and these smell molecules um, that basically what you're smelling is evaporation into the air. And um, they do point out in the article, not everything, you know, it's light enough to float, but not everything that's light enough to float has that has a smell. Right. Um, and what do they point out? Carbon monoxide is the, the common danger. Right. That you can't smell it. You might be dying. That's why you have the detectors in your home. Yeah, if all of a sudden you can't think right. Yeah. And there's no other reason why. It's probably carbon monoxide leak in your house. That's right. There's no old Vicodin around. <laughs> you should check the battery on your carbon monoxide detector. So the um, not only do some molecules not have a scent, they're just not odorants, some odorants aren't smelled by all people. Like apparently sandalwood, natural sandalwood, is the most commonly unsensed odorant. Yeah, the natural, original, the OG. Right. Yeah. So even even if you are making a perfume or something like that, you may be making something that can't be smelled by a significant portion of the population. Yeah. Which is a challenge in making perfume. Yeah, and the whole cilantro thing, I, I posted a link mm-hmm. to a story about that. I know we've talked about it before. It's like 10% of the population has a genetic marker that thinks it tastes or it's taste and smells soapy. Yeah, and this article points out that what's going on is not that there's some alteration of the smell or taste of cilantro, yeah. but that there's a note to it missing so that it's incomplete what people are sensing, right. and therefore they find it gross. Yeah. But I saw another study that showed that 30% of odorant receptors are different from person to person. Take any two people. Yeah. Thirty percent of their odorant receptors are going to be just wildly different. Yeah. So it is a real challenge to make sure. a perfume that is pleasing to enough people, and as a result, some people have gone the opposite way, and they're just making exactly what they think is super cool. And if you like it, awesome. If it smells good, great. If not, whatever. Right. But that's kind of counter to the the main mode of thinking in the perfume industry, which is... Widest audience is the best. Exactly, because more people are going to buy it and you're going to make more money. And if it's a really good one, it'll be a classic that people develop like a brand loyalty to and buy again and again and again year after year. Chanel number five. Yeah, which... Classic perfume. It is, and it was the first perfume to use synthetic ingredients... Did you know that? I did not. And apparently, it was not a hit right out of the gate. It was created in the 20s um, for Chanel, but it wasn't until Marilyn Monroe, in an interview in the mid-50s, said that all she wears to bed are two drops of Chanel number 5, that all of a sudden it was like... Sure. Forever. The forever perfume. (laughs) So every guy bought it for his wife. I get Yeah. Because it would make him think of Marilyn Monroe. But it's just stayed that way ever since, even even though the Marilyn Monroe story has been kind of lost mostly to popular culture. There's a documentary on Coco Chanel. I haven't seen it yet. It's supposed to be good. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I'll have to check it out. Um, so perfume oil specifically uh, is a super, you know, this is what we're talking about being like steamed or pressed out of like a fruit or a plant or something. Mm-hmm. It's super concentrated. So... It's only it's going to be in ninety eight percent alcohol and two percent water. So that's the solvent. Yeah, and then you take the solvent and the amount of solvent that's combined with perfume oil. You have different types of perfume. Yeah, exactly. So parfum, and you know it'll say this on the bottle mm-hmm. if you if you go to if you've ever read the back of a perfume bottle, <laughs> um, which I haven't. But uh, parfum, p a r f u m, is uh, at least twenty five percent perfume oil. Uh, eau de parfum, 15 to 18%. Uh, eau de toilette or toilet water is 10%. And eau de cologne is... Um, like 2 to 5%. That's Axe body spray. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's light. It's very light. Yeah, like uh, body sprays. Unless you're talking about like a just a straight up cologne. Uh, it can also mean a man scent. Right. Uh, which is sometimes way more than 5%. 
Yeah, I, I think I've said this before. When I lived in Yuma, Arizona, um, post college, there was uh, a lot of dudes wearing cologne, and yeah. I was like, "You guys are still wearing cologne, huh?" Yeah. They're like, yeah, man, you don't wear cologne. I was like, "Nope." Where's your curve? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and um, yeah, it was it was, uh, it was a very strange thing to me because I'm just I don't know. I don't see a lot of guys that wear cologne anymore. Oh, maybe, it's definitely falling away again. Maybe I'm in the traveling in the wrong circles. Well, in America, it was it was cool at first, and then yeah. it kind of fell away. And then, um, thanks to Marilyn Monroe and Chanel, it kind of came back big time. Yeah. Um, and then it kind of peaked, I think, in the '90s for men, especially. Um, but it's still going strong. Like one uh, one Armani Gio di Armani, I think. I can't remember what it's called. Um, it, it made like several hundred million dollars in you know 2006 is that one of the uh unisex ones no but it's for men okay yeah yeah i always thought that whole new uh well it seems new the unisex cologne i always thought that was interesting well originally design something for both men and women right that's a throwback actually um originally there were no gender differences among any perfumes especially in france um, in the French the, court, the men like to smell like lilac as well, it, right? <laughs> and the, you know, nothing wrong with that. Sure. The idea that lilac is a feminine scent is a new and social construct. Yeah. You know, um, or the idea that cedar is a manly scent—that's right. a, a new and social construct too, and very American as well. Sure. So when it comes to categorizing, like we were just talking about, uh, there are terms that are used in the biz, but um, it's not like there's any rule about it. It's just basically how people have grown to talk about perfume. Right. They're in the business of perfume. Uh, but generally, there are these categorizations. Uh, floral, that's a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. Uh, fruity, that's a no-brainer. Uh, green, that might be grassy or leafy. I like stuff like that. Yeah. Um, like the olive oils that taste like grass. You ever had those? Uh, yeah. Man, those are good. Uh, or wheatgrass shot. That is not good. Ooh, I love it. Do you? You don't like it? No. Oh, man, I love it. It's like drinking down some grass clippings. <laughs> I, I, I think I would rather drink grass clippings than wheat grass. Really? Yeah. Well, it is like grass it. clippings, actually. Right. Literally. But like fescue or something. Sure. We'll take a fescue shot then. I will. Uh, herbaceous, uh, like herbs. Uh, woody, like wood. Amber, tree resin. Mm-hmm. thought that was interesting. Uh, every time I want to say uh, an, uh, animal, like I want to say animaniac for some reason. <laughs> Uh, bodily smells. That's gross. Well, that's like from, that's musk. Yeah. It's a bodily smell. Well, but then there's musk as its own category too because it's just so singular. Right. But I mean like um, there's also supposedly also, I guess either, I don't know if it's a subtype of musk or animalic or whatever, but fecal is another thing too. Yeah. Calvin Klein's obsession is among the perfume industry well known as a very famous fecally perfume. Yeah? Yeah. Which one? Obsession. Obsession. Yeah. Like a hugely selling, very popular yeah. perfume being worn by people. If you walk past someone in the perfume industry, they're going to be like, there's some real fecal notes to that one. Well, they said in this, the top notes, they say sometimes can be something really nasty just to attract you. I don't know what attract means, but I guess to get your attention maybe. But that'll wear off the quickest. Right. So it's not what lasts on your body. Right. Which we'll get into that in a sec. Let me just finish this little list here. Okay, sorry. Uh, you have the oriental, uh, and it's proper usage here, um, amber and spice. Um, and then a few other ones are categorized by the actual molecules, like phenolic. Uh, might smell like tar or lactonic, creamy, lacted, uh, lactose, obviously. Right. Or aldehydic, uh, which is fatty. So uh, those are the main categories, um, and we will get a little bit more into that chemistry that we teased you with right after this. So, Chuck, we talked about... um Perfume being diluted, like heavily diluted. What a ripoff. It's almost all alcohol. Yeah, what right? a rip. The reason why, though, 
It's not. It's not a rip. It's not a rip. <laughs> I know. You would not want the perfume oil, which again is just essential oils or synthetic versions of those oils, and fixatives or synthetic versions of the fixatives. So it might be essential oil of lavender, some muskrat anal gland, <laughs> and then solvent <laughs> is most of the other stuff. It's, I'm laughing, but it's true. And then, bam, you got a perfume right there. Yeah. But the reason why it's so dissolved and why so much of it is alcohol is because the way that perfumes are designed is so that the different types of molecules, when they interact with the alcohol and the alcohol evaporates, will evaporate in a certain progression of time. Yeah, I thought this is the most interesting part of this whole thing. The alcohol actually makes it possible to separate those notes. Right. Um, and they likened this article to hearing all the parts of a symphony at once. Like a lot of pleasing things all at one time is not necessarily a good thing. No, and that's what you would get if you stuck your face in a one-ton barrel of perfume oil. Yeah, you might say, man, this is sweet, but you wouldn't pick up on the subtle uh, right. the subtleties of those odors. Yeah, exactly. But what alcohol does is it takes that concentrated form. It not only dilutes it, but it, again, spreads it out temporally. So when you first put it on, um, you put on a little perfume, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. The immediate notes, the top notes, are what you smell immediately. Right. And they go from anywhere like immediate to maybe um, a few minutes usually. Yeah, the first ones you'll smell and the first one to leave your body. Exactly. That's the top notes. And a perfume is designed so that w as each set of notes, and there are three, there's top, heart, and base notes. Mm -hmm. um, as each one is leaving, the next one is starting up. So yeah. you have this this basically flowing transition. Uh, uh, comparing it to a symphony is so apt. Sure. Because it's just like this kind of flowing melody of scents yeah. that work together by, um, I guess, dissolving, evaporating yeah. at a certain time, at a certain rate. Yeah, and like we said before the break there, uh, a lot of times they will put something unpleasant in that first top note um, and I guess it will just get your attention in the store. Yeah, you're just like, oh, that's so fecal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or like, um, what was it, an anchor man? Oh, the musk? Yeah, it was like Puma musk. Oh, oh, that one. The Puma urine or something? Paul Rudd's yeah. cologne. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, I can't remember the exact line, but like 70% of the time it works all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, what was it, Panther... Uh, yeah, it was Panther something. something. Man, that was a funny movie. Um, and then you've got your heart notes next, right? Yeah. And how, how long do they ones. last? Uh, they kick in anywhere and last for starting at two minutes to about an hour okay. from what I saw. Um, and those are going to be – it can be entirely different. It depends, as we'll see, what you're trying to get across. Right. But you could do woody top notes with a vanilla – Base or heart note. Sure. So it'll go from wood to vanilla to lemon, citrus, base note, right? Sure. Or you could do it completely opposite. You can just mix and match. It's like the Oak Ridge Boys. It depends, <laughs> right? It depends on the um, the the type of molecule you use. And as you're making synthetic um, odorants, yeah. You can make a, a, a synthetic odorant that's going to stick around as a base note, even though if you had an essential oil of that, right. lemon, it would be just a top note because it's going to go away so quick. Yeah, and as we'll see later, when, you, when, it's, when you're making these perfumes, it's a real science of, and a balancing act of getting exactly what they want because these smells, as you said, are coming and going, and um, it is sort of like uh, composing a symphony. Again. Again, man. Um, so the base note, that's the one that's going to stick around the longest, though, right? Right. And come out latest. Yeah, it can come out starting usually about 30 minutes after you put it on and can stick around for a day if you're not careful. And didn't you find something where uh, the perf no perfume is going to smell the same on any two people exactly? Right. Not only is it not going to smell the same on any two people, it's going to smell different to any sure. two people, right? Right. Because, again... Uh, 30% of our odor receptors are different in, in every single person. Plus also, an odorant can activate different kinds of receptors right. depending on the person. And then lastly, that person is going to encode it differently. Yeah. Because scent is, a, is definitely its own thing as far as our senses go. And 
it's the only sense that's um, directly hardwired to the brain. So the odorant receptors go straight to the brain. Yeah, it doesn't send it to a nerve cell that's nearby first, right? Exactly. So it's like har- our, scent of s- our sense of smell is yeah. hardwired to our brain. So it evokes some serious reaction sure. in the brain. And there's also a, a hypothesis that our brain, the lobes of our brain, evolved from olfactory buds. That that's what they started out as. Oh, that would make sense. And that it just grew and grew and yeah. grew, and that we were all like brainstem and olfactory buds, and then we the brain grew from that, which would be like hats off to s- the sense of smell because that's what started it all. Interesting. But there's there's the point is is that our sense of smell is it's a big deal, um, but it's different in each of us, and when you factor in our body chemistry, our skin, sure. That's when it's it's it genuinely does smell differently on different people. Well, I would think it has to because everyone has a natural um, scent. I think just as a person, mm-hmm. that's different from one another. Exactly. So when you, so you combine these, it, you yeah, know, it's got to make a different thing. You know, right? It's like if I smell like uh, cherry pie, and you which you do, throw some Cool Whip on me, which I would. <laughs> Gross. I wouldn't do anything. I just throw Cool Whip on you. <laughs> okay. You know. Um, in the form of a pie to the face. <laughs> Why not? That old gag. Yeah. Um, but when you're putting on the perfume, this is this is all coming around to this point. Um, there are ways to do it supposedly that uh, will get the proper, um, I get the, get the most out of your perfume. Like you shouldn't put it and rub it into your skin real hard. Yeah. You don't want to like heat it up right away or anything like that. No, because then you break the chains of the top notes and you wear them out before your finger even comes away from your skin. Yeah. You just like, kind of uh, dab it on lightly. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you just did like the old lady move. Dab it behind the ear maybe. Yeah. Or uh, uh, I've seen the other lady move to uh, to do it on the wrists and maybe rub that together a little bit. And then um, my my big trick was to, because uh, I never, I liked the, the Benetton colors, mm-hmm. but I, even back then didn't want to be super cologne-y. Uh-huh. So, you know, I did the deal where I spray it in the air, then, like, walk through it, you know. That's even, I think, mentioned in this article. Oh, is it? As is a, a method? Yeah, that's a method. Okay. Um, I was really onto something at 16. I think even rubbing your wrists together, though, would no probably... Good. No, because yeah. you're, you're gen- you don't want to generate heat. And one of the reasons why people put it behind their ears or on their wrists... It's stinky behind your ears, for one. That's one. You sure. can also smell it yourself right there. Oh, yeah. But if you put your fingers behind your ears... Uh-huh. And then put them like, uh, I don't know, on your head or something. You'll see that behind your ears is warm. Yeah, sure. On your wrists is warm. These are pulse points, right? Mm-hmm. So your hot blood is close to the surface of your skin. So then that heat will start to break up the alcohol, will make it evaporate, and will hence make those different notes come out. Nice. That's all the heat you need. Any friction is too much heat. Right. So th- you say no on the wrist rub. No wrist rub. Okay. I mean, if you want to waste your money and just get heart and bass notes and no top notes, go for it. <laughs> all right, Josh. So let's say – I thought this was all pretty interesting too, actually. Yeah. Let's say you want to uh, launch um, Joshness. You work for Polo and you just – you want to do Joshness. Um, you're in their perfume department and you say, guys, this is going to be a – trust me on this one. be a top seller. Right. So you go to Polo, your bosses, and they say, all right, Josh, uh, what we need here is a brief. Um, and the brief is going to outline um, – because, you know, again, you, you can't say this is a perfume everyone's going to love because they're like, there is no such thing. So write up a brief. Tell me who is going to love it, who it's going to appeal to. What um, do you want it to smell like? Yeah. What do you want this to say even? So Tom Ford launched one. It became very successful called Black Orchid. And he said, I want this to smell like a man's crotch. That was one. Can I give you another brief? Please. Um, For Pure Poison from Dior, the brief included, what is it like to have something soft and hard at the same time? Oh, I think we all know that. All right. And then um, (laughs) here's another one. I don't know what this one was for. That's a Viagra ad as well. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, I don't know which one this is, but um, one brief described what they were after as, Give us the scent of a warm cloud floating in a fresh spring sky over Sicily, raining titanium raindrops on a woman with emerald eyes. <laughs> that's what somebody wrote down when they were trying to describe what scent they wanted. Yeah, I mean, that's those are legit briefs. That's 
that's how you're supposed to do it. Describe not just um, the specific sense that you want, but what do you want it to say? Uh, generally, it's probably more something like you know, classy, or uh, you know, prosperous, or something like that. Fecal. Fecal. Um, then you want to write out what uh, how you're going to sell it, like um, what form it's going to take. Um, you also want to have a marketing plan, like uh, I think we could sell this in the in South America for the next like five years. They're going to go crazy for it. Yeah, exactly. So then after that, it's going to go um, to a chemist and it's going to get mailed to what are called fragrance houses. Well, because the, Polo doesn't make it themselves. They no. don't come up with it themselves, that is. And the chemist is employed by the fragrance houses, and they send this brief out to a bunch of different fragrance houses and, and basically start a competition. Like, yeah. who, who's going to land this account? But, this yeah, is what exactly. we want. See what you can do. So this fragrance house, they, they do a couple of things. They have the perfumers who... They actually are the chemists who come up with the the formula. Yeah, they've got all these scents in their head, and they, oh, yeah. they know, like, oh, I know exactly what smells like a woman with emerald eyes. Sure. Super smellers, I would imagine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, there's an odor tester job out there that's supposed to be great. Uh, I, I don't know if I'd do so hot on that. Oh, yeah, you have to have, like, just a naturally wonderful nose. Yeah, my nose is not naturally wonderful. It has to make, like, a curly cue. <laughs> Uh, these fragrance houses also have, they don't just, um, write the formulas. They also have the, the stuff in stock, um, all these different ingredients in warehouses, or they will work with another company who has it. If they're like, we don't have, um, you know, papaya, oh, de papaya. So we right. need to work with a company who does, right. they will sub that out. And they have these chemists that actually work with, um, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. Yeah. Which we've talked about in something. I can't remember what it was. This can be used for other things. No, it basically analyzes odorant molecules. Yeah, to, to say that here's, here's what it's made of and here's how you can make a synthetic version of it. Exactly. For cheaper. So, right, exactly. So then you have those people, those um, chemist analysis, analysts. Yeah. And then you also have synthetic chemists who, say, who take the readouts from the gas um, chro- chromatography yeah. and say, oh, I can build this. And then they build the synthetic molecules. Exactly. Which and is all these, just mind-blowing. It is mind-blowing. Yeah. All of these people are employed by the the fragrance houses. That's right. Uh, one thing that they do, we, we did talk earlier about, um, you know, how they have this stuff in stock. A lot of times it can be the actual oils from pressing it and uh, steaming it. Yeah. Um, but there's Putting another... Putting a headlock. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, there's another cool thing they have, though, called uh, Headspace. And that is when, if they want an odor um, or a fragrance, they will they will put like an avocado in a jar and um, suck out the air right. every hour or constantly for hours. Right, and then they use gas chromatography to analyze that. And sample. analyze that. There you go. And then somebody goes and builds that, right? And that's, that's right. what's called the headspace. The headspace is basically a synthetic version of a an existing natural scent. That somebody trademarks, and then all of a sudden it becomes part of the perfume industry's repertoire. Yeah, I mean that's the space in the jar. That's the literal headspace, right? That is is got the odor. There's a dude named um, Christopher Brosius, and he started a company called Demeter, and they're known for making like really weird perfumes, like yeah. birthday cake, baseball mitt. Baby aspirin, <laughs> just weird stuff like that. Ooh, baby aspirin. But what's neat is they nail it. Yeah. And one of the ways they nail it is by using, by making head spaces. One of the first ones they did was called Soaked Earth. He took some um, dirt from his parents' farm, yeah. put it in a bag, and took it to New York and threw it on the table and said, I want this. Nice. And they analyzed it, and by God, they came up with dirt, the smell Sp- of specific dirt. Specific to his region, though, right, I would yeah, imagine. Yeah, yeah. You know? I think Pennsylvania. Interesting. Um, I guess here we can uh, briefly mention that um, knockoff colognes and perfumes uh, yeah. is a very common thing because uh, your copyright, I mean, you can tweak your formula slightly and it's totally legal, you know, to, to sell that essentially the same thing. Right. That's just sl- oh so slightly different under a different name. Right. It's like the same thing as designer drugs. Except with perfumes. Yeah, remember that, like the gas station. If you love, if you like Giorgio, you'll love whatever we're calling oh, yeah. this. Sure. 
What was the knockoff name for Giorgio? Georgie. But there was like a whole generic ripoff line called, if you like blank, you'll love blank. (laughs) It's hilarious. So, Chuck, um, you take all this stuff, you take your headspace, you take your existing headspace, you take your essential oils, and you put them all together to create that um, emerald eye woman who has titanium raindrops raining on her in Sicily on a spring day. Yeah, well, you do anywhere from 10 to 100 of them. Each fragrance house does. Yeah. Then they send them to their odor testers, and the odor tester goes, no, 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 this one's a maybe, no, no, I like this one, Yeah. no, no, maybe again, yes, and then no. And then Polo, at this point, has not smelled any Joshness yet. No. This is all, they're trying to weed out the gunk, because they don't want to waste Polo's time. Right. You know? Yeah. They don't want to send them 400 Josh's, Joshnesses. Exactly. No, they want to send them like one, maybe two. And they do. Sure. So Polo will then get it, say, "Uh, I like the second one, but it's a little too strong on uh, this one scent. Um, So it'll go back again. And it's just a process, basically. Maybe they nail it on the first time. Probably not. But probably not. It's a back and forth, basically. It's it's just like working with an editor. And they'll swap in ingredients and they'll, you know, like we said earlier, it's a science, basically, of the right combination in the right order of evaporation. Right. I think it's just super interesting. They put it through product testing, of course, um, to see what people think of it because they're not just going to launch it uh, out of the blue. Uh, they want it to, like you said, appeal to either the right demographic or the, the most people possible. Right. And so the one that um, Polo decides that is Joshness. Yeah. Um, they win. That perfume house wins. And so they get a contract to produce X number of tons or gallons of this particular perfume. Well, of the of the the uh, perfume oil. Yeah, exactly. The undiluted stuff. Yeah, Polo actually produces. They take that and produce the perfume. Right. They yeah. add the solvent. Sure. To produce the perfume, the eau de toilette, the eau de cologne, all that stuff in the different concentrations. They will probably also use it in maybe like a deodorant, a body lotion, all that stuff. But they deliver them in like one ton drums of the perfume oil that you don't want to smell until it's been diluted. That's right. And then all of a sudden the Joshness is released into the world. Literally. And becomes the number one selling cologne of all time. (laughs) Well, and um, Polo never knows the exact concoction that makes Joshness either, which I thought was super interesting. Right. It's literally the perfumer uh, knows this little secret. Yep. It's kind of neat. Exactly right. Uh, so after this, we're going to talk a little bit um, about the science of scent and uh, whether or not it's something that we're born with or uh, that we learn. All right, so Chuck, yeah. why do people wear perfume? Depends on who you ask. Okay. Um, there's a lady named Rachel Hertz uh, from Brown University. She wrote a book called The Scent of Desire, colon, Discovering Our Enigmatic Sense of Smell. Mm-hmm. And she postulates that uh, depending on how old you are and what gender you are, you have your different reasons. Right. That uh, young uh, men do it to attract women. That's why I did it. Right. Uh, older men do it out of gratitude to the women who gave it to them. Yeah. Honey, you'd smell nice with this on. So, sure, I'll wear it, dear. Right. Uh, you women, uh, depending on how old you are, in the 20s, you're more affected by, or I guess inspired by your friends in the media. Beyonce. Sure. She has her per- own perfume, doesn't she? Yeah. You know who has like a surprise runaway smash hit right now is Sarah Jessica Parker. Uh, that doesn't surprise me. It does me a little bit. I mean, it wouldn't like have a, surprised me in like yeah. 2002. Oh, yeah. But, like, it is a top seller right now. She's, like, a goddess to a certain uh, age group of women, though. Yeah. Like, I guess, still. I guess you're right, but e- even still, you'd think, like, yeah, I don't know, maybe they're right in the perfume wheelhouse. Yeah. It could be an awesome-smelling perfume. I've never smelled it. I was just surprised because, yeah, yeah. you know, you're, like, Beyonce, Derek Jeter. <laughs> like, these are the celebrities <laughs> cologne, that have right? the, yeah, it's yeah. top-selling, that have these top-selling, like, colognes. And then Sarah Jessica Parker, it's just... I just don't think of her like that. Yeah. I don't I like her. She's great. Yeah, but I get it. I, I just don't think of her as that and I'm I'm happy for her success. Yeah, she's iconic to I, a certain demographic. Yeah. Um, not to me. 
But she's she's not an icon to you. No, she's an icon to Emily. I think. Oh yeah, she was a big fan of that, that show. Um, women in their thirties, they say, follow no particular pattern. They're just I don't know what they're doing. They don't know what's going on yet. They just like what they like. I think is what that means. Well, by the time they're forty, they say that's uh, simply because they like it. Like I just like the way this smells, and I'm forty. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna just wear it. I see. I don't care what my husband thinks at this point. Or what my friends think at this point. Right. Um, in their 60s, they say women think of other people's wishes, like uh, their friends or loved ones say they like the way it smells. Right. Which is a really nice thing. And then a lot of um, people choose perfumes, uh, apparently, that their mother wore or in the same scent family. Yeah. W- either knowingly or not, but probably knowingly because um, there's a, an associative learning theory of smell. Yes. You were saying before the break we were going to talk about whether you know smell is learned or if we're born with it. The idea that smell is learned is called the associative learning hypothesis. That it's learned? Yeah, yeah. That like we come to like smells based on social constructs, based on experience. There's supposedly evidence that smell learning begins in the womb even. That yeah. odor and molecules can be passed along from mother to child and that the stuff you're exposed to in the womb, you can show a preference for later on down the road. Yeah, and Rachel Hertz is a member of that camp. Yeah, and by the way, I want to give a shout-out. Rachel Hertz wrote a chapter for the book Neurobiology of Sensation and Reward, which is a gas in general, (laughs) right? Yeah. But she wrote Chapter 17, Perfume is the title of it, and it's on um, the NIH website, the NCBI website. Just search for that, and it'll come up. The whole chapter is right there, and it's really interesting and exhausting. But she is one of the ones who's like, this is a learned behavior, and lays out some yeah. really great um, evidence for it. Yeah, one of her points is that um, that babies basically don't think anything smells bad or good. Right. Um, I don't know how they know this. I guess wafting things under a baby's face to see it's what exactly kind of right. face they make. Including poop. Well, yeah. You never never see the baby like Not curling complaining. up. No. Yeah. Like I'll, I'll wallow in poop. I don't care. I'm a baby. Sure. I don't, I don't mind the smell. You ever farted right in a baby's face? <laughs> no reaction. <laughs> they just blink? <laughs> Nothing. A couple of times? They're delighted. Well, plus also... Um, other studies of adults, not even babies, have shown that the same smell can be preferred or disliked in very similar groups. Yeah. Uh, in the UK, the smell of wintergreen in a study after World War II was found to be just generally disliked. Yeah. In the US, like a decade later, the smell of wintergreen was found to be generally preferred. Yeah. In the US, wintergreen is used for like candy and gum and it's associated with positive stuff. Sure. In the UK, wintergreen was used during World War II um, for medicines that oh, were yeah. used in the field. So there's associations with battle, war, maiming, huh. disease. Yeah, yeah. So that's what wintergreen is to people in the UK, whereas in the US, the exact same smell is pleasant. Right. And, you know, I mean, it's not like the Americans and the Brits are the exact same people. Right. But they're in the same cohort, you know. Sure. Uh, a very similar cohort. And they showed, like, opposite preferences, which is really great evidence for associative learning hypothesis. Yeah, and it, it's also a reason why in the early 2000s the US Army was not able to come up with a uh stink bomb that was universally upsetting to people's noses yeah. across cultures. Yeah. Uh they contracted out the Monell Chemical Census Center in Philly and they uh tried to f- curate a universal stink bomb smell. <laughs> and uh they said, you know, because of cultural specific uh uh, products and things, we, we had to avoid anything like food related, even if we think it really stinks, some other culture might like it. Right, exactly. Um, so they had to basically go to, they focused on uh, stuff with biological origins like vomit and human waste and burnt hair. And uh, <laughs> they made synthetic versions of all these and got some people in Philly and put them in a hood and introduced these. Oh, those uh, poor people. <laughs> I know. I thought it was funny that it was Philly, though. They're probably like, hey, it's not so bad. <laughs> um, and they introduced, they slowly infused it, and they said people thought it was the worst thing they'd ever smell. Uh, their heads would jerk back. They would contort with revulsion, and then basically just try and hold their breath as long as possible <laughs> or take little shallow breaths. Sounds like a great stink bomb <laughs> to unleash on people in Philadelphia, at least. Yeah, but they couldn't, basically, they couldn't come up with anything that was 
universally hated. So, um, do you remember the Air Force also tried to come up with a gay bomb? Uh, yeah, that used like some yeah. sort of perfume to turn like <laughs> enemy combatants into like just gay lovers. So silly. Um, it's a shame though, because the stink bomb is actually really like it's a great idea. You know, it doesn't yeah. hurt anyone. There's no. It's not like a a chemical. Uh, <clears throat> Like you know, what do you call it? The the, the sprays, an like irritant. Yeah, it's not an irritant in any way. It just it stinks, and oh. it would keep people out of a sensitive area. Yeah, if they didn't want them there. Well, chemical um, irritation is a sensation that your nose experiences along with odors. Yeah, so it is like, technically sure. a stink bomb. Like pepper spray is a stink bomb. Oh yeah, yeah, but it has like an, an actual physical uh, right. effect on your skin. Yeah, which a stink bomb wouldn't. Um, but the other school of thought, though, is that it's, uh, uh, you know, it comes via evolution, basically. Yeah, that it's innate. Yeah, which this kind of makes sense. They both make sense to me. I think it might be a mixture of both. Um, but uh, what's his name? Gilbert? Or Hilbert. Hilbert. One of the two. So if you're in the Gilbert camp, though, you're going you're gonna to go with the evolution because he points out that um, when we were evolving, you know, apples – smell good because you're meant to eat them and you're meant to spread the seed um so that smell is associated with living and uh, living well right by eating fruits and conversely the smell of poop and vomit and urine um which convey disease and bacteria and all the stuff you're not supposed to be with uh under innate hypothesis it would be that's why we avoid those because we need to avoid the the substances that carry those obnoxious smells makes sense oh it it totally makes sense i just think to me the evidence is more there for associative learning yeah i think i think it can be both i don't think it has to be mutually exclusive yeah and i think it can be overwritten by the by the learning as well yeah uh whatever innate things we have um and i I remember we did a um, bit on a study years ago about um people looking for their mates according to having a different immune system, yeah. which would in turn make their children uh, immune to more possible uh, things. Yeah, more robust immunity in the kids because yeah. you take immunity A and immunity B and yeah. put them together, you got immunity C, which is the best of A and B, right? Right. So this, this is like a whole idea of why or how people select mates is based right. on that. Which is scent-based, right? That's what they think. Yeah. And apparently, it's this is um, evidenced by study after study after study that finds consistently that women rate a man's scent as the number one factor in attractiveness. Yeah. More than his appearance, more than wealth, more than anything else, scent is perennially the number one most important thing. They think that it's possible that the reason why is because um, our senses are attuned, our scent is attuned, uh, so that we can sniff out somebody with a different yeah. immune system so we can reproduce more robust kids. The problem is, if you factor in cologne, what you're doing is deceiving that natural drive, yeah. and all of a sudden you're going to have kids with like zero immune system because right. the guy was wearing cologne. Yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, you don't want to confuse your potential uh, mating mate. It's a pretty good argument against wearing cologne. Yeah. Um, and then there is the, uh, of course, the whole does this stuff work anyway as far as being a sexual attractant. Right. Uh, and there's there's zero scientific proof that there was any kind of um, aphrodisiac, asic, aphrodisiac, ick, ick <laughs> compound <laughs> that you can concoct that will literally um, draw someone to you sexually. Uh, as much as they've tried and tried to advertise that uh, subtly or not so subtly, um, we are not pigs who apparently do have f- mating pheromones that actually work that way. Uh, they have something called a uh, accessory olfactory system. Uh, and in pigs, they have something in their nose called the uh, vomeronasal organ, mm-hmm. which is specifically specialized to pick up on these molecules. And we don't have them as humans. No, we don't have the curly tails either. Or they say we may have them, but it just doesn't work. I don't know, which yeah. is which is the case. Who knows? It, maybe we just use our normal olfactory senses, and it's not pheromones. It's just smells. Yeah. You know? Sure. Or, you know, they say maybe it'll make you think that you're more sexually attractive, so that'll make you more confident. Exactly. And thus make you more sexually attractive. Right. Um, I got one more thing. What so I got? mentioned Giorgio. 
Yeah. Giorgio is a huge, hugely popular, maybe the number one scent of the 1980s. Um, and it was famously banned from some restaurants. Oh, because it was so stinky? Yes. Wow. Because some restaurateurs were like, if you got a couple of people wearing Giorgio in here, it's going to overpower the smell of the food and the taste of the food. So they banned Giorgio, which all it did was accelerate sales. Well, there are some people in this building that I wish would be banned from our elevators. <laughs> I almost never run into that anymore. Oh, boy. I, I, I've smelled some stuff that they're not even on in the elevator car. The fecal? And I step in, I'm like, whoa. Is it like obsession? No, it's usually like super perfumey lady stuff. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. You got anything else? No. I mean, there's plenty more. Yeah. But, yeah. Only got so much time. Uh, if you want to know more about perfume, you can type that word in the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com. And since I said search bar, it's time for listener mail. That's right. I'm going to call this a little Nostradamus bit from a Canadian. Uh, hey, guys. I'd like to say how uh, great, first of all, that you make my hour-long commutes to work every morning. So thanks. Um, it's a pleasure to listen to the show, especially on Nostradamus. I thought I'd give you another example of what he supposedly said. Uh, quote, from the calm morning, the end will come when of the dancing horse, the number of circles will be nine. That's from Nostradamus 1503. Okay. Uh, she says, Talking about circus, obviously. <laughs> she says, it was said that Nostradamus predicted the end of the world and was explained as follows. Uh, Korea is the calm morning country. Uh, Sai dancing, as in doing the dancing horse, is Gangnam style. On December 21st, that song reached one million views on YouTube, nine zeros. In summary, people were claiming that Nostradamus' prediction was the end of the world would be on December 21st. So that's it, guys. Keep on doing what you do. You do a great job, and you're always a pleasure. And, oh, the sound effects are awesome. Kudos to Jerry. Way to go, Jerry. Uh, that is from Julia K. in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Hey, we love Toronto, a.k.a. Tirana, right? That's right. We love it. Well, uh, let's see. We want to hear from you. Let us know about your perfume preference. Uh, you can tweet us your favorite perfume of all time or your most hated perfume of all time. Sure. At SYSK Podcast. You can let us know on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know. You can send us an email to StuffPodcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, StuffYouShouldKnow.com. <laughs> Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.